Welcome to the Fast Track of Innovation, a data-driven podcast. Here, data isn't just numbers, it's your superpower, sparking stories of success from bites to breakthroughs. Dive deep into insights from the Data-Driven Conference, where data heroes assemble. Ready to supercharge your data journey? Strap in, it's time to get data-driven. Sponsored by Reltio. Reltio's AI-powered data unification and management cloud capabilities encompasses entity resolution, multi-domain SaaS, master data management, or MDM, and 360 data products. Reltio helps enterprises transform poor quality data from disparate sources into unified, trusted, and interoperable data. All right, welcome to another data-driven podcast. My name is Chris Detzel, and today we have a special guest on uh, the podcast. It's Willem Kunders. Willem, how are you? Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me. I'm doing great. How about yourself? Doing well, man. We were just talking, I always think of the pre-show, and you are telling me this is your first podcast to be on. I was shocked with all the stuff you wrote and everything else, and so really appreciate you coming on today. This is very Um, much an inaugural event. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here. That's Let's great. See how it goes. <laughs> That's going to go great. I have no doubt. Tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do, and and the kind of people that you work with on a, a daily basis. Of course, sure. My name is Willem Kulnes. I'm originally Dutch, so speak with potentially did a little touch of an accent here, but I spent my entire working life working with data. So right now at CS, I'm a leader of the advisory service around data management, data governance. I can lead their practice globally. And before that, I spent a decade um, with Deloitte. Maybe interesting to share as well that did two years of that in Europe, about six years of that in in the U.S. if you add it all together. I led a practice uh, and helped found it, co-found it in Latin America for two years. And as right now, I'm uh, in Morocco, actually. So a lot of these experiences have been scattered all over the world. But yeah, for the most part, in the last couple of years, I've worked with a really extraordinary string of chief data officers working on kind of the biggest topics across financial services, banking, insurance, retail, CPG, technology, a little bit now, medical technology. So yeah, it's been, it's been a fantastic run. Yeah. That's great. And, and you, you've had such a, a vast background and backgrounds. You've, you've dealt with a lot of customers or a lot of people, CDOs, like you said. And, and so I'm really excited about today's topic around balancing offense and defensive strategies. And what that really means, uh, you mentioned that as we were talking back and forth, and can you talk a little bit about what you meant and how do you define offensive and defensive data strategies? Yeah, for sure. Here's at least my interpretation. And so when I think about offensive and defensive data strategy, it's, it's almost like maybe let's take both of them and understand what they can be. So if, if you have an, an offensive data strategy, you are focused on enabling positive outcomes, right? So you want to leverage data to achieve some sort of positive outcome like growth or revenues or profitability, drive innovation, drive competitive advantage. And it tends to have, these tend to live on the business side uh, of an enterprise and they tend to be heavily focused on AI and analytics use cases, right? That's, those are typically the more offensively oriented strategy. If you have a defensive strat- uh, data strategy, it's more about preventing negative outcomes. So again, it's not necessarily you know, enabling positive one, but preventing negative ones. So think about data security, privacy, compliance, risk management, all those kinds of risks that need mitigation. They tend to sit on the legal or the accounting or the regulatory sides of an organization and they really, and data strategies that are heavy kind of on the defensive side, they tend to emphasize compliance, governance, and security capabilities. So that's how you can characterize those, how I characterize these two types. Is there any like specific examples of an offensive strategy and a defensive strategy, like a real life thing that you can think of? Yeah, and I've worked uh, for, for a lot of years within the banking industry, for example, where they tended to be extremely strong on a defensive side, right? They have mm-hmm. very strong regulatory regula- regulations in terms of, for example, their liquidity reporting. And if they, if you don't pass those tests, so if you don't pass a stress test, if you don't pass those 
basal test. You can't evidence what data you're using for these tests, where it's coming from, its provenance, and they can turn off your lights, literally. They can shut yeah. down your organization. So like that, they are extremely focused on the, uh, we're at least on the defensive side. Right now, that's a little bit in the past. They start to open up more on the offensive side as well. Offensive, think about the company like Netflix just comes to mind randomly for me. If you think about what these guys do, like how data and AI is at the heart and core of that business model, like how they track what you watch, how it may impact the experience that you're having, how it can help them recommend the next, the next recommendation yep. there. They're changing, and then this dude, they're doing this on the go. It's not like they did it like five years and that's a modern scene, like they learn every day. So that's yeah. all about that customer experience, like leveraging and the insights that they have. So there's just two kind of examples. No, that's good. And why do you think it matters to recognize these two strategies? Mostly like anything with the help, like strategies about decisions, like always, it always comes back to making decisions. And so in this case too, you can't do it all. Right. So sometimes there's a trade off and sometimes a trade off is really about I have a million dollars to spend or I can onboard three people in my new CDO team. Am I going to have them? Am I going to look for someone who can really reinforce the compliance with a certain regulation or I'm going to re onboard someone who's really great in generative AI and helps me figure out how I can bring this to the different business lines. Right. So some some of it is really just a trade off. Um, but I think that is that there's a little bit more also to just having a balanced data management strategy in general so that you want to be to want to recognize that both of these sets of objectives and, and benefits exist and you want to make sure that you have a right balance like you don't want to necessarily 100 percent go one way or without kind of losing sight of the other one like you want to enable not completely shut down the innovative innovation yeah. capability that you have but you also don't want to like unnecessarily open yourself up to risk so th those are some of those considerations of why it really helps to figure out which of these uh, matters the most, you know, to this to, to your enterprise. Do you think companies have both? Can they go both offensive and defensive? Or do you basically see companies go one or the other? Not in the extreme. So you, can't, you cannot be completely offensive or completely defensive. It just doesn't work. Because if, if at the end of the day, there are, if you push it too far, you push it far enough, there will be trade-offs because offensive is all about getting the data to people as quickly as you can, whenever they want it, in the format yeah. they require it. Defensive is way more about locking it down, it, it, it just oversimplify it a little bit. But like I, I, as you may have seen, like I, that is if you push it very far, right? But I do believe very strongly so that there are absolutely things that you can do for a foundational enablement perspective to actually do both like some things like having a base basic foundational capability to manage your metadata or having a catalog for example like doing having some minimum level of data quality that is necessarily for both like you need to have that anyway if you want to enable like a customer segmentation or these new recommendations like you need to know what data you have where it sits the quality etc it for, in the exact same type of metadata you would require to be able to identify how do I classify it? How do I protect it? So there are bits where you can absolutely make decisions to enable both. If you push it a little bit further, uh, then some trade-offs will appear. Yeah, it makes sense. How does, how does data governance and compliance fit into these strategies? How does data governance and compliance fit into the strategies? Governance first. So governance yeah. to me is a foundational one. So data governance is almost a... It's, it's, it is actually interesting. And very often, like when we come to a new client, I also want, first want to establish what do you interpret? What do you mean with data governance? And how is it different from data management? But in, in any case, data governance for me is really all about how do we ensure that data management, which is broader, how you actually do it? What are the roles, responsibilities, the policies? Like, how do you go about making sure that the data is appropriately managed? That's a foundational capability. You need that for both. You cannot have a very effective offensive data strategy if you haven't figured out some sort of foundational things around things like data ownership or some key data assets and things like that. And in the exact same way, if you look at it from a defensive perspective, you need to have those those kind of foundational capabilities. Compliance is is pretty pretty completely on the defensive end. Right? That is a defensive yeah. objective, and and a lot of capabilities underneath that are would sit on the defensive side. Yeah. Not to get off too much, but data governance is to go back to the data governance piece. It's a pretty hard thing to do when you go in and 
look at a organization, do you ever think, oh my goodness, this is going to be rough to get a governance piece set up? How do you go in there and just say, you know what, you have to set this yeah. up and this is how you do it and that kind of stuff? Yeah, there's, depending on where you go, it could be a relatively young company that is more struggling with, they want to be able to scale and not get caught in kind of a breach because they grow too fast versus these huge behemoth organizations that have stacks all over the world. But a couple of challenges that I pretty much always see, there's still a pretty negative connotation to data governance. That's right. That's almost the first thing that always, almost always appears. Like we tried this. It worked. This person was here. They left. Like there's always that negative connotation to to kind of battle. It's like a, a cost to the organization, and if that makes sense. And I've I've seen some places where they just try to rename it data enablement, do the same thing. <laughs> sure. Which I'm not necessarily a big fan of that, but that kind of happens. Um, but like the the I guess the good news is you just got to be able to tell the story in general. Yeah. So not when we come in in a new place, but that's the first thing. Very often you start talking to the, the CDO, whoever it is, the head of data governance is like you want to change that story. Like data governance is not a it's not a cost to the organization in that sense. It can never drive value in and of itself. It's always mm -hmm. tied to stuff that drives impact one way or another. If you don't know how it's driving value then go back to the drawing board, right? And you may want to reorient yourself. That's like the one thing that I would say is it's, I, I guess you, you have some tricks eventually and test stories to tell, but that's, that is definitely one to, that we run into very often. Yeah, that was good. And how do you measure the success of an integrated data strategy? Is there any tips, tricks there? That's another tough one, right? It's very, if you look out there, there's this famous um, statistic that is quoted that says CDOs don't last or last on average less than three years. I think it's yeah. 2.4 or something That's like right. that. Well, a very important part of the explanation there is that they struggle to articulate how they're creating value. And so that all of that has to do with what you just said, measuring a data strategy or, or an inter integrated data strategy. And so... A couple of things that I believe I've seen that work really well is, first of all, the realization, like a data strategy is, in a sense, not separate from a business or organizational strategy. It's not, right? It's not you're doing something else. You're not a different kind of company. Like, it's really the interpretation of what can you do to drive value somewhere else? That is sometimes... The there, there are some data leaders out there who believe they are the actual business leaders in some ways. And, and for the most part, you're not. Like, you are helping marketing guys or helping compliance yeah. guys like that's what you're effectively trying to enable like their business process need to work and so with that in mind there's just this I'm sure you're aware this kind of revamp or reintroduction of this concept of data assets and products which i think is very helpful in this area because before you had CDOs or data teams, or they were they had an annual budget of like several million dollars, and then at the end of the year they would be asked like, "What did you do? What did you?" Mm -hmm. And they said, "Well, I've got two thousand data quality rules. Completeness is ninety seven percent. Like things like that. I I cataloged ten thousand fields, but like, okay, well, what does that mean? Right? Nobody, that, yeah, nobody knows what that yeah, is. That's so, right. Yeah, exactly. So, which are to a data governance professional, like those can be very impressive things to to, to have done." Like what you can do with an asset and a product where you basically focus on actual kind of logical groupings of data that have inherent value. It can be customer data, it can be transactional data, it can be a mix. And by definition, they have several use cases attached to them with quantifiable business impact statements. And now, mm -hmm. as a CEO or a data leader, all of a sudden you, you don't say, I have this many data quality rules or this many fields catalog. No, you say... My team is keeping 11 data, I'm making up the numbers, so I'm, yeah. I'm keeping up 11 data assets up and running who are supporting 37 use cases, which are supporting half a billion dollars in revenue and about $25 million in risk mitigation. And so that's a better story for sure. Yeah. And of course, the thing that matters, like it doesn't really matter if it's half a billion or 700 million or 300, because when you get to that point, people are like, oh, okay, we you know yeah. the ROI is so high. That's the, but like, in, in any case, that is what I've seen work. Like anything else, <laughs> tough. I agree. I, th I think at the end of the day, like it's all about the business outcomes and what the data is doing. Like the, if, if I'm telling people some of the things that I'm doing, I give you all these metrics 
And it's not that metrics are important. Obviously, they are. When you talk to a leader, a business leader, they don't care. It doesn't mean anything to them. So you got to, it, it's just in anything that you do with data yeah. is what is the meaning and what's that story that you're trying to tell? You got to tell, you got to understand some of that. So what are some of the pitfalls or con pitfalls when measure, trying to measure the success? You mentioned a couple of them, but just wondered if there's a few more. Yeah, common pitfalls in terms of measuring success or maybe slightly broader in, in this kind of concept of offensive versus defensive. Like I, the first one thing that comes to mind is like, that you completely overemphasize one side, right? What we're, which happens, it tends to happen. Like it's someone yep. who tends to be very strong in either of these two, who then grows into position to own a strategy, right? Who thinks that's the key to, to unlock, unlock the value. And so you completely focus on kind of the AI or the analytics and the offensive side or completely on making sure that you, just a client I was at earlier this week on, on data sharing, when they basically said, because they had the chief legal, chief compliance, et cetera, officers all in the room, and they said, we're to locking it down. None of this gets shared ever again until all these approvals are in place. And then until not realizing that, that means your organization grinds to a halt. And so that yeah. literally doesn't work. You can't do that. And so in any case, the overemphasis on either side is, is some sort of a pitfall, kind of oversimplifying it. For sure. I already mentioned the minimum foundational capabilities, right? But at the same time, I'm almost like, how do you say that? I'm like, I'm invalidating what I just said myself, but in the sense that there are foundational things that always make sense. Don't like, don't try to get the business case super detailed done for like the first initial foundational things around like metadata or a catalog. You won't get it. Like you won't get it in year one ever. It's always a little bit further down and you got to believe in it. You got to tell that story. And go with it. Like that's once you have that, and once you go, as I, as I mentioned, from one or two assets in year one to like now you're supporting 10 or 50, that ROI will be there. But there are some foundational things that always, literally always, uh, make sense. If you right now are a company out there that in any meaningful way is data driven and you have not paid attention to a minimum amount of metadata management, you're you're lost. That you, that's going to come mm. back to, to bite you. And then actually in line with that, I would, the last thing is a cliche, but super true, right? Which is don't start too big. Don't do it everywhere. Don't do it all domains or all data everywhere all at once. And uh, just to pick one is pick one area or one asset or one subdomain, I would say. But, but not just that. Do it like smart. Like yeah. something about that there's value, right? Figure out if there's value before you even get into all the nitty gritty untangling data lineage or whatever it ends up being that you, you end up doing. And then that business person, like your very first one that you would actually work with, don't pick the most skeptical one. Hey, pick someone that's that right. actually, yeah, no, but it's really true, man. Like, I agree. The first one, you want to have someone, a friendly face who's on kind of a business or similar side mm -hmm. who does, who needs help here and who can help you tell that story so that you can tackle the somewhat harder ones a little bit further. Like that to me is, Maybe some commonsensical, but like things like if you don't do them, they become become pitfalls. That's weird. You say, say it's common sense, and it sounds like common sense. But I remember I, I used to work at Forrester Research, and one of our, one of the analysts at the time, his name's Jeff Scott, and the one thing that he said he was doing enterprise architecture kind of stuff, and you can imagine whenever they're doing big projects, he said, "Look, you know, go to the people that are for you and that will help evangelize." What happens over time is. You'll get three or four kind of business cases, use cases, and that person that was skeptical now has to listen to what you're doing because yeah. you created so much success in these other three or four areas that it's just going to be helpful. Sounds like common sense, but it's not always common sense. You just think you need to get this one thing going and they're not agreeing with what you're saying, you know? There's something buried in what you just said, even like what uh, the anecdote you shared, which is about like celebration of success and socialization. Like that, there's like this data governance negative connotation. You really have to be deliberate about calling out successes. Send Love that it. email, have the council, call it out, put those people out there and say, this worked. I had just also last couple of weeks, a global technology company, very big, very, very advanced in a lot of different ways. And there were two kind of areas that were actually very similar in, in a lot of different ways, similar tech stack, similar seemed to be like maturity in a lot of ways. And one was, you know, very well able to get those products up and running, at least seemingly. And the other one was stuck somehow. They just couldn't get it off the ground running. Mm -hmm. And just upon looking at it a little bit closer, like really the key difference was 
this this whole social like wrapper around everything. Like, why are we doing this? There was a weekly note. Somebody just took 30 minutes to know. Here's the stuff we did. Great stuff. Like, here's the people who made it happen. And it seemed a little bit silly and cheesy, but it's, it's critical. It really is. Oh, I love that. I had a had somebody tell me, Chris, what you should do, and I'm not saying I do this every day, but it's along the lines that you said is every week or two, write down all the things that you've accomplished that you did and that 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 happened in the business from what kind of you you did and send that out to certain people. It could be your boss or it could be a business person or whoever you're trying to and just be consistent about it. Because what they do is a lot of times they'll just read over it and be, oh, that's interesting. And then, you know, gives them opportunity and it helps you to know what you've accomplished throughout the year, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, when you go and do your own review. I think that's great. I love that idea. Um, yeah. So is there like a link between offensive and defensive strategies like data and data unification, 360 views and MDM? Is there a linkage between all of that? Absolutely. Yeah, hundred percent. So there, I would relate it back probably to the, when I'd mentioned around data assets or, or products or what you would call them, like the these 360 views or 720 views or the MDM, they are almost the best examples one can think of. If you have this data product or asset and you do it, it unlocks, it unlocks the objectives on both sides. Probably the best examples out there that I could come up with. And j- just to maybe unpack that a little bit more, yeah. From a defensive side, if you look at what you just mentioned, like a 360 view, say for customer, right? And it may, it may actually be enabled by an MDM, but let, let's say that there's just an asset or two in here around customer data, like no matter what kind of industry, but imagine it's something about like names and phone numbers and ages and jobs and who knows, contact preferences, maybe there's some customer data that's becoming a, a bit more uh, sensitive uh, out there today. So... For you to be able to truly depend on that, like for you to say Netflix or say like these truly where you let the model make the actual decisions, like it's not even just an analytics report, but you have actual decisions that are happening based on the insights that are built out of these views. What would you need for that to be able to be done, which is trust? You need to trust the data that it's correct, it's timely, that you can understand it that there's no black box here in, in how it got there. And so that trust is enabled by the defensive kind of nuances of these products or assets around insisting on metadata, insisting on the classification, the definition, like the lineage, where did it came from? Maybe business rules around it. And so this is in, in, in a little piece I'd written somewhere, I, I called this literal, this is quite literally defensive off enabling offense, right? There's things that you do to to make sure that you truly manage it so that afterwards the people from it with an offensive mindset, they don't even need to think, they trust it. And so they, and if I, so if there's a link between offensive, defensive strategies and things like 360 views and MDM, like absolutely, because they are, they will, if you do it right and help you enable both of these things at the same, at the same time. Love it. What are some predictions, and this is our last question most likely, but what are some predictions for the future around offensive and defensive data strategies? Predictions or hope? What do you want? <laughs> but maybe the... Hey, what do you I, think? I, yeah. Hope? I, I like the hope, but if there are specific predictions, that's helpful. So let, let me just at least, hopefully these will coincide or they converge, okay. which is like the data governance of the past that has a bad connotation mm-hmm. is the one where you had armies of analysts or consultants often that came in, helped dig up like the system that somebody else put in there and tried to figure out like where the data is coming from and Mm. retroactively measure data quality. It's a data governance that has a bad reputation that also has a very relatively low ROI in investment. Like I predict and hope that the data governance of the future is one of data governance by design, right? So that is where if you have a new business process, a new platform, a new whatever it is, like that people are going to become smarter to integrate these things when they are created. So that it's really only a very small tax once the engineers are there and they know exactly why they're creating systems, why they're taking them from 
one source and not another. If you help help fix the transformational life cycle, then I think that the strategy will go a, little, but a lot more to doing these types of things by design. That That's one thing because that, those big mammoth pro- projects to, to solve kind of the, the spaghetti mess of the past, I think is mm. something that nobody wants to own anymore. Yeah, and the second bit is uh, very much open to me. Is all if, if you think about this whole spectrum of offensive data strategy, defensive strategies, and specifically the capabilities that kind of fall in there and maybe enable part of both of these, is the the smarter, more intelligent, and AI driven approaches to to do this, right? So how how can you do some of these things with the technology that is out there, more automated, better, higher quality? It's, it's, how can you do that better? And there's you can do probably a whole other episode on, on literally unpacking those, but that's a massive, massive one, right? And so a little bit early to tell what's really going to happen, but there's a ton out there. And some of these things are maybe just process discipline. Like it, it is kind of automation. Like you just make sure you build something new. It just automatically is readable by your, your spider, your data catalog. But there's also things like how you can maybe use some of the LLM or Gen AI capabilities to interpret the data that sits in in certain systems and specifically also the unstructured data, right? Mm-hmm. And data governance was virtu- virtually completely focused on structured data because that's the only thing we could do, right? Maybe not anymore, right? That's maybe... That's a huge opportunity is the unstructured data. Yeah. One of my, one of our customers talks about that all the time. He thinks that AI is going to be a huge opportunity to help with some of that, so... That's exciting. Yeah. One, if I can just squeeze one, one quick, super specific yep. example in here is like one of those clients we work with right now, like they're a technology company. So they have tens of thousands of SKUs like that they build and they have R&D related to it. But the actual truth, the actual kind of source of that data are filed documents because they have to file them in different places for compliance and, and patents and hmm. whatnot. So the actual source of it is actual text. They're actually in PDF and that won't change for a while. And so all of that is eyeballed now, right? So if you go back to <laughs> product IDs, the descriptions, to like yeah. dimensions, colors, everything about it, like they have to go back to these documents. Like that is something that is not even that potentially compl- complicated to train. Like how would you be able to govern that data a lot better with some of these new technologies that are out there? It's a good point. I, I worked at a company that electrician company, and they had all these SKUs, big 10, $15 billion company, they had all these SKUs. And that's exactly what they were doing to push that out on these product SKUs out on the the e-commerce website. They sold to B2B. And so yep. everybody was eyeballing, copying and pasting de- descriptions and things like that. When it just, I was like, they literally had a team of four or five people doing this. And that was a and he, all day yeah. job and they couldn't get done. They still can do. I think that's where AI and stuff will also play a huge role in some of that stuff. So, well, and this has been great. Really appreciate you coming on to the Data Driven Podcast. So thanks everybody for listening in to another Data Driven Podcast. I'm Chris Detzel. Please rate and review us. And Willem, thanks so much for coming on to today's show. Thanks, Chris. Take care.